was a version of that I wrote when I was on the Newport Youth Band. I had an octet or a nonet, and uh, the basic chart was, you know, was there. When I joined Maynard's band, I then elaborated, obviously, to, you know, for the for the soloist for Maynard. When I did the chart for Maynard, um, uh, I, like I said, I elaborated. You have a great, wonderful saxophonist, Frank Vicari, uh, and and Kenny Rupp on trombone. Both uh, Kenny Rupp passed away recently. Frank had passed away a number of years ago. But um, Kenny had a wonderful sound, like a J.J. Johnson-ish kind of playing. Very underrated player, great section player. And that rhythm section was nice, too, with Tony and Ron McClure. It was a nice rhythm section. The thing that was interesting and sort of flattering and embarrassing was that when Bill Kirshen did that anthology about um, picking a, a chart that sort of exemplified, best exemplified the band, a band. He did one of Basie and this, and he picked Green Dolphin Street. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm flattered. And then at the same time, I'm thinking, boy, am I going to get flack from Slide or uh, Sebesky or Willie Maid, considering all the great stuff that they wrote for the band. So, I mean, like I said, I was flattered and, and a little panic stricken. Uh, I, I, I never even discussed it with him why he picked it. You know, it was his obviously his, his idea that he loved it. And, uh, and at, of course, at the time, the Green Dolphin Street was a hot tune. Everybody was playing it. And, uh, and, and it was a hot tune when I was on the Newport Youth Band, even. So this is just, just adding like some of the high trumpet parts, changed some of the harmony, added the saxophone solely. Uh, bass, almost the saxophone solely was thinking of maybe Bill Levin's piano solo, a piano, Bill Levin's playing a solo my thought behind the saxophone solely on that. And um, it was it was nice. I mean, I thought the chart, we played it. I, I'm not always sure that was the best version on the record. We play, we've had better versions of it when we played live. You know, we settled into it a little bit more. Um, but listen, it's, 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 it's apparently it's worn well over the years. So that's, can't, I want to fight that. They want to mess with success, you know. Now that particular uh, recording, that band, you know, alto, two tenors, baritone. Most when when we think of big bands, we usually think of five saxes. So when you write an arrangement for just four saxes, how is it different? Well, it's it's not that that much different. I mean, since the way I voice the chord, it's I I don't necessarily need five saxes to make it sound big. I still got the alto, I got the, the high end, I got the two middles, and I got the end, bottom. So it's it's the hardest thing writing for the band was the fact you had two trombones and three trumpets. You had a smaller brass section, plus you had Maynard, you know, with his thing, which was a separate entity. And and that was the hardest part is trying to trying to not make it sound too brassy or oriented sometimes. Uh, sometimes I succeeded, sometimes I didn't. I think it succeeded later on with things like Whisper Knot and, you know, kind of kept the, the register more medium, medium rare as opposed to screaming. Um, not saying things on some things like Chicago and, and, and some things like that. But that was the hardest part is trying to the balance between the brass and the four saxophones. So even though you, you, you think you're missing a voice, but I mean, if you can't find four good notes for the saxophones, you're in trouble. You know, basically.